good to have you all here. I'm Tim May. I host the AI Meetup. Today we have a great presentation from Matthew Denman. He's going to talk about sort of a new approach to using AI in terms of a UX UI experience. Sort of challenge some of the long held beliefs about the way UIs actually work and show some maybe new ways of approaching it. That I've seen the demo and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So I'm glad to have him here. Um, as you guys know, we meet every um, month at Tech Alley. We have an AI meetup group. If you want to join that group, I will send you out uh, invites telling you what the next group is going to be. If not, so I'd encourage you to join the group. It's on meetup.com, just look for the AI meetup in Las Vegas. So with that, no further ado. Oh, I do have a microphone. So as we have questions, kind of wave your arms, stand up, dance, whatever, and I will bring over the mic so that we can get you um, on. We're, we're taping this, so that way we can actually hear the question or comment. So. Awesome, thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Denman. I'll be doing this presentation. I appreciate you spending some time with me to talk about this topic, um, which I actually uh, find this thing to be very interesting. And uh, most anyone I talk about this to um, does also uh, find it typically fairly interesting, which we're going to be basically talking about application understanding and control using an LOM conversation. So you've probably seen chatbots dropped into a website and whatnot, and sometimes it will let you do things, um, you know, get things done. It's kind of along those lines, but more deeply integrated, more trying to be, um, you know, fusing the boundaries between surfacing portions of the user interface um, based on the conversation you're having and being able to... Um, have the AI perform actions in the application for you. Um, so the, kind of what we'll be talking about is just a, looking at your application structure as a graph, you know, nodes and, and um, edges, lines connecting them together. And uh, we'll be talking about that AI assisted user uh, guidance. So being able to drive the user um, through the application instead of having them n needing to know how to do things in the app that they would be able to just have a conversation and the AI does things for them based on what's happening. Uh, so we'll take a look at how that's done and um, compare kind of the fine tuning a model versus embedding or using prompts that, that would do that. So uh, I've been kind of guiding, kind of talking about through some of this, but the idea is that a large language model can be given a bit of information about the application that's hosting it. So you might um, tell it that, hey, you're in this app that lets you create stories or create managed customers and sales um, processes, um, or perhaps you're using it to um, go through purchasing uh, online insurance. Like, commercial auto insurance or other things where there's a lot of data to fill out and a lot of information they may need. And it can be hard to get a person to go through a traditional application like that. So um, how can the, use, the user experience be improved um, using an AI uh, conversation? And ultimately, I think like now a lot of times you're talking to it by typing. Um, but a lot of people now you see more and more where you can just talk to it through voice, voice to text. And so you have that kind of option and that'd be the ultimate way um, to kind of manage that. And I would like to separate the concepts of like AI conversation controlling the application, being able to do things on behalf of the user through the information it has already. Um, and the application that I'm going to demo this in. I mean, those are two separate things. You could apply the concept of controlling an app and being aware of what the user is able to do uh, separate from the specific examples that I'm going to show. And um, part of that is going to be to you know, personalize that experience. So to build a profile about the user and how much awareness they have in different parts of the application so that as the AI is having a conversation with you, the style, like is it holding your hand and introducing you to the concepts from the beginning? Or is it just kind of checking off, yeah, you're here, this is what's going on, you're ready to do these tasks or whatnot? <coughs> Here I'm just trying to show a very high level drawing of um, how you might see an application for this purpose. 
and you could fit this on top of existing applications a mainframe application um, where you're using a 3270 terminal still has these kind of concepts where maybe you're in some kind of home view it's like a dashboard when you first get in it takes you to some kind of a home view and then you might have menus that navigate you to a media view or in, in my example like Quest games or customer uh, lists, say upcoming sales presentations or anything like that. Personalities that you can, AI personalities that you could build and um, be able to edit the story. So each one of those are like different views into this particular application. You know, and there's other views, but this is just meant to be a simple example. And um, one of the things I'm trying to show over here with the story view is that you might first navigate to story view where you're seeing a list of your stories. And then from there you click on a story and now you're in a detailed view where you're able to see um, the details of the story, edit it, and maybe um, do more work on the story. It's a book or something like that. So, um, Normally, you just drop into a website, think about your bank website, like Bank of America or Chase. You need to understand a lot of concepts around banking and how to use a website to know that, oh, there's a menu option to switch accounts, or that I could pay my bills with Zelly or something like that. Those things um, require me to have an understanding of all the functions that might be available. And actually, for the longest time, Zelly and stuff was there, and I didn't really know what it was about until someone wanted me to pay a bill with Zelly, and I had to learn and figure it out. So um, it was something that was just sitting there on the interface, and I never used it. So breaking this down, you're going to see like this helps for you to understand, like, where is the user at? Like, think about it like it's almost like you're gamifying an application. The user has a state. They have a session, like a, how much do they know how to use the media view? Have they ever used the games? Have they ever built AI personalities for a marketing reports or something like that? So if not, um, I might interact with them differently when they're in that state. As the user like, says, hey, I, I need to be able to create a personality for a new content writing on this website and I want to build it um, that can do this kind of writing style. Well, it could take that and navigate for me to the personalities view and start creating the new object, you know, the create the new personality and start putting in values and then say, how would you like to continue? How would you like to refine? And we'll put them over those kind of things here in a moment. So here's an example. I want to bring up a demo. Uh, and just so that I don't have to worry about internet access, I have recorded some of these things. Um, I think towards the end I may show a real uh, interaction, but here I am on the home page. And on the left, I have these navigation menus. I can just click to navigate if I knew what they were for. But on the right, I have a conversation, and if you look, you know, Matthew, um, how about if we first take a look at your schedule? Remember, you have a speaking engagement at 11 a.m. I made this recording this morning about NAI integration. You apt. After that, would, uh, would you like to continue on with one of our recent conversations? Perhaps discuss the deep integration of AI into the main user interface, the course, this discussion here. Or well, before we can dive into reviewing your writing styles for content creation. So it's um, offering me. Uh, like you start the app, it initiates the conversation, it's offering a set of tasks that it knows that I've done or may want to continue doing and allowing me to say, yes, let's go um, do something like that. So the key here is that I could not show the menu on the left. And imagine that you're just having this conversation and it surfaces the interface in the middle here when it thinks you need to do that. Like, because you said you want to write a story, the story writing view pops up. And that the only way to navigate around is by through the conversation. But then later, as you get to use the app more, the menu could appear. And then you could now just click to navigate on your own. So I did want to show, I'm going to go ahead and place through some of this a little bit. And um, there's no audio with this. It's just me and I'll talk through it. So. There it is, um, because it manages this particular personality, Malazel is managing, and so, um,
actually, I think I saved this was, um, this actually will show an interesting, so I, I put in, uh, this had a little issue, so then now it shows the um, list of things that I can do in the app. And if there's a particular page you'd like to visit, actually, um, and here I did, ref I think I did refresh it so I could try to show, here we go again. So I'm typing in, because I, I didn't want it to, I didn't want to have it see that little uh, brain fart it had there. So there it gets it right away. And um, so now it's showing me the functionality. It has an awareness of the functionality that can have in there. And um, if you notice the way it's talking to me, um, also I said, uh, let's see the stories I have so far. Notice it navigated me to the story view and it has a list of stories that it knows that I've been, it knows I have done more. Like it knows about every single one in here. And um, if I continue that, I want to edit the perfect scoop story. So that's just a part of the story title, but it navigated in and took me um, to that content. Now I could have just clicked and done those activities. If I knew how to use them, then I could just interact with them. Um, but if I didn't know about those kind of capabilities and what I could do with them, then, um, then uh, that would make it to where it would be difficult to you know, properly build a story. So now I can just have a conversation or even as I'm doing things, my navigate myself around, it will, um, if I have another demo here, not that one. Make sure I get this. Get the right one. Yeah, yes. Uh, in fact, um, let me make sure I get this. Oops. It looks like I, oops, come on. All right, so um, this one shows another example here. Um, this one, I didn't really want to show this one right away, but I will. What this is showing now is um, part of what you can see here is as I was clicking, like I clicked on this web pages collection, I just clicked on that. It's telling me you've moved over to the web spider view. Here you can use the browser plugin if you have it installed to monitor a web page for data collection. It allows you to fill in um, uh, forms, press buttons, and so forth. And then I say open the YouTube Music uh, web page. And so it's navigating to the YouTube Music page here. Uh, so what this is showing is the ability to control web content outside of the actual application. And in fact, it can have awareness and control of any web application beyond itself. By, you know, like here I tell it, um, open the Wikipedia page for Star Wars, and now it's navigating away for that too. So um, being able to um, build these kind of interactive capabilities, having it fill in content for you, is a nice way to um, introduce the user to the capabilities of the application and yet still allow them to control and take over the, the application at any time. So use the conversation, use the menu, um, if you feel like you have a better handle on what the app can do. Uh, so another, uh, not that one, let me see here. I have a, another image here that I wanted to show. So here, um, part of what makes this all come together is uh, if I show this, um, you can see that here's the pages again in the application, but they each have a set of tools associated with them, including like the story edit view. So if you think about it, there's a set of tools for each set of pages. Like, I want to be able to um, 
know what story you're in. So if I'm in the story view and you're editing, um, I could offer a tool to say, what is the story that they're editing in the state of it? And the response could be, they're editing this story, they're 80% complete, they're waiting to create this content, and it already knows all the stages of what a story development is in the beginning of the prompt. When, you, when you're describing the application, if you remember I was saying, when you go into the app or when you're navigating around, you have the ability for the app to be told, hey, here's what they can do in this page. Here's how like a story can be developed and pushed all the way, say, to um, Kindle, you know, to publish a book or something like that. So each one of these, like, in media view, how do I upload a document? I want to be able to um, upload a document. I have a tool that will um, click the upload button and actually bring up the menu, or the, um, the finder view, where you can just pick the files that you want to upload into the system so that it would um, have the knowledge that's in those documents. So each one of these views, you build a simple little tool, and this kind of shows, here's another screenshot, that's showing I use YAML. So on the bottom here you can see open web tab and it's got a scope of global. That means that that, that command is available all the time. Whether, no matter where you are in the application, um, you can um, trigger, the, the AI could say, I want to open the web browser and navigate to a specific view. And so um, I don't have to first go to a specific page. Whereas um, if the scope was story writer, that tool would not be given to the AI to even know how to use until I navigated into story writer. It might know how to go to the story writer view. It might know there is a story writer view and what it can be used for. But it doesn't at that moment, like if I'm in the home view, it wouldn't know, oh, you're able to... Um, you know, create a new, you know, a new tab and go off, you know, or create a new story and change the title, change uh, the title. You have to select the story and be in a different view. Um, and this is, these descriptions and parameters are important. This maps up to, if you've ever used OpenAI's API, they have, or even Anthropic, both of those have the ability to define tools that will, like, usually they give an example, collecting data, like, I want to get the weather. So the user says, what's the weather in Las Vegas? It doesn't know, but you gave it a tool where it can say, here's the city name, give me the weather. But think about those turned on the application. You're going to have tools that tell it where you are in the app or what are, how far you're along. You're editing a new customer. Have you got their credit approved? You're doing commercial auto um, insurance, have you gone, what phases, have you done a background check on the drivers, their, their, um, their IDs in order to price out the insurance. So all these things, all these awareness, a lot of that comes down to how you word these. That's how the AI is going to know. If you've done any prompt engineering, you don't need the OpenAI or Anthropic to support tools. Before they did, you could still get these things to work by saying in the prompt, like, hey, you're in an application. You have these views that they can do. Uh, a story has got these parts in it that you can edit. And so right, you have the beginning, you're 0% done. When you've got a summary, you're like 10% done. When you've done the full content outline, you may be 50% done. And it knows all those stages and can guide you through the development of the story because I've written out, like, that knows those descriptions. You put them in the prompt with everything else, and now when the user's text is added in there, it's got all this other stuff that goes on top of it. So um, these are the kind of things that basically you include in the OpenAI prompt calls. Like if the user said, um, I want to create a new story, and then at the beginning of that you told them, um, I want to uh, be able to uh, create new stories with this create story tool, and all it's returning is JSON output that says, here's the name of the tool that you said I could call, and here's the parameters like this one here to open up a web page it needs a URL. So, so what's the starting URL if it's going to go to the web browser? So if the user you saw, I, I typed in, I want you to open up a web page to YouTube Music, it knows the URL on its own. Like, I don't have to train it, those URLs. It seems to know, like, 
Wikipedia Star Wars page, it figured out the URL on its own and went right into um, that on the browser for me. So it's actually, I found it to be pretty good. I think we have a question now. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So I guess what you're doing with these views is you're using these views to essentially aid your prompt engineering, right? So like you've got your tools here, and so when you're in the story view, you're going to be passing in these tools as like um, aids the prompt essentially, right? Right. Among other things, sure. Right. Yeah. And then do you have a single LLM for each of these views, or is it like multiple LLMs? Um, I do support like uh, either SAS LLMs, so... Uh, I use like a design pattern where I abstract behind an interface. I don't use um, Langchain, which is one way to do that, but mm -hmm. I support OpenAI, Anthropic, Grok, the, two, the new one that's out in beta, and then local models like Llama and um, a few other like Samba, which is kind of a really interesting uh, model that's a little different. It's not transformer based, but it does LLMs. Okay. So it, I, I support a, a whole bunch of models, and um, I can switch between them based on the personality. Um, so some personalities require models that have features that other models don't have. So then it kind of forces any conversation or any work that um, personality is doing in a conversation to go through a certain model so it doesn't get moderated or something along those lines. And are those personalities fine-tuned from these? I guess they wouldn't necessarily be fine-tuned because if you're using OpenAI. Yeah, so. I, um, and I will kind of have a slide specifically about um, fine-tuning here and whether or not you would want to do that. So, um, and I just already went through, I kind of skipped through some of these slides here about, I, show, I showed the JSON output mm -hmm. uh, while it's YAML output for the tool calls. And... Um, Another thing about that is you don't just create that YAML file of tools. The reason why I put it like that is so that it's easy for someone to edit the English, but along with it, if I have an open web page tool, the browser needs to have a function ready for it to recognize I can call that. So you have to have little code in, the, in your application that's like view the web page or change the title of this story or navigate to this other view. You had to have written that JavaScript. Like when I first built that, I didn't have those YAML files. It was just all hard coded. If I had a pro, you know, if I had JavaScript, this is the tool, the text that went with it was a part of that and it just went up. But um, my, this is a multi-tenant system and a child comp, you can sign up for a membership as a company, get your own website, have these AI tools exposed in your application that you can control the CSS and all that with, then you can edit these to use your business language so that the AI interactions are around the language you want for your application, not for, so you want to be able to edit the prompts, if you will, right? I mean, the things that make up the prompts, yes. So just a question about that. When training um, the model, uh, if you have unstructured data, how are you storing that? Are you converting that text into, uh, you know, into JSON, or are you just importing that uh, those documents into like a vector database? There's or a set of, There's a basically a RAG system. Are you familiar with RAG? Yeah. yeah so yeah. I use RAG now. That's a separate. That's why at the beginning I was trying to say I want to separate the functionality of AI conversation that can be aware of a application and control the application for the user based on the conversation. And now we're getting into the land of what is Matt's app that uses this do beyond like, so yes, you can upload documents. Those become a part of the rag. And when you have a conversation, it's doing an embedding search and the cosine similarity type search to get chunks of documents that would apply along with the conversation itself, along with the tools. Uh, there's prompt layers on top of layer because you've got the personality prompt that builds on top of the prompts for the tools that get put into place for two. So all these things work together to kind of guide a conversation right. and be able to go back. And like I have a example where in the middle of all that, I said, hey, I'm getting hungry. Where can I 
get some lunch really quick and it gave me three restaurants within five miles of where I no. was that I could go and get food for because it could dynamically switch context. Like but that. specifically, you were using the example for businesses and using their business language and all that. And what if that's stored in documents? Like what specific uh, database or software are you using to store um, those, 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 those? It all goes into Elasticsearch. Are you familiar with Elasticsearch? Yeah, uh, so, oh, uh, so you're using Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch and I also use... Um, uh, Pineco? Uh, no, okay. I, I use Postgres for standard data things. For structured data? Because uh, I build a semantic network. Like I'm, I'm deviating off of the slides here, but I'm trying to. Uh, okay, uh, I'm, sorry, so I'm sorry. Every time I upload a document, I also process it for business relationships, like semantic network. Like Matt Denman went, lived in Las Vegas. That's kind of like data in there. And that gets stored in, um, in a, a node, uh, in another type of. Um, Graph database. Oh, and the graph database. Yes. Okay, thank you. We're not, no, no. Uh, Neo4j. Yeah, that's it. Neo4j. I, the name would slip my. Uh, so I, but uh, so, but Postgres is my. I call that the the moment of truth for all data, because I back up. I take backup and restore very seriously, and and the data in um in like say. Um, Elasticsearch, it can be re-indexed out of Postgres. So you could just totally destroy my Elasticsearch and I could just bring up the, um, another pod from the, from the Kubernetes cluster and it would pull up and index uh, all new data again right out of Postgres and be up and running when that is done. Because uh, I don't want to have to back up three, four different databases when I could just back up one, you know, so. Uh, and it all is in, inside of there for various reasons. Uh, and I'm sorry if like if that deviating. Like, I know not everyone here is an engineer, right? And so I was trying to gear this class towards people who were prompt. Like if you've ever done prompt engineering, a lot of what we're talking about is how you build your prompts. You're basically building a prompt that says, "Hey, you're in this application. This is your world." Like. You've probably, if you've done any prompt work, maybe you've gone to um, the playground in OpenAI, and you can build like this agent. They have a whole way of building an agent, and they're saying, oh, agent is uh, agenics or whatever is the future of AI, right? So if they're trying to um, have it to be where you're going to be able to build something that says you're all about converting, you can translate to French or something like that. Or you can um, help book airline tickets on Expedia and that's your agent. Well, think about it like that is the agent is really your app, you know, and everything it can do is what is capable of being done in the app. Yes, did you have a question? Yes, I have a question. So the underlying data because to be scalable, right, it can be a performance issue. So how do you necessarily structure that to make sure that it pulls the right answer, there's no duplication, or uh, is that like, do you have a cafeteria table that's summarizing the data from different- Well, all right, so there's, we're, getting, we're getting into like two separate topics because in a way, just navigating the app, the tools, like you don't, that's like a, not, a third way of providing data. Like you could fine tune a model, right? You could use a RAG system where you're saying, hey, here's a bunch of references I think you're going to want to answer the question the users got, just wrote for you, like what can I do in Las Vegas today or something like that. I might have, have had documents with all these venues I want them to go to. But a third way is tools. You can not give it the weather report for Las Vegas as a part of pre-RAG data. I could say, hey, here's a tool. When you need to know the weather report, you respond with, hey, go get me the weather report and give it back to me. So it's like this little exchange. Instead of it sending you text to show the user, it's sending you a tool command that says, hey, go get the weather report for Las Vegas and give it back to me really quick. And maybe you don't show that in the conversation, that piece of it, that's hidden from the user. You might just show thinking or looking up on the web or something like that. And then um, they say, uh, oh, I, here's the weather, and it says, oh yeah, the weather in Vegas is uh, 80, high of 86 and all that. Like it knew it all, but I didn't have to give it to it in RAG. I didn't have to fine to the weather report into the model data itself. I was able to build a tool and it was able to ask me for the data it needed. In a way that's better than RAG because in RAG, you're, I type in what's the weather report and it, it does a cosine similarity search and finds chunks of text that 
sound like weather report vegas you know similar content and then it uses that when it could have just said i have no idea what it is but you gave me a tool that i can get me that info so i'll call that i'll give it the data and now i'll act like i knew what the weather was all along and it didn't so that's the third way yes so we have things like the semantic web that are kind of built to help machines connect. Uh, do you see like AI assistance taking us down the path that stuff like that kind of becomes obsolete and it, it can just communicate without standards or without little notes saying this is the way you get a, an insurance quote and maybe the robots that text file says here are the six things you can do on this site if you're a robot but it kind of gets away from the need for a semantic web or something like that yeah i mean as you get to that way um i think that there's been i think that um tim has uh thoughts on that particular topic because it touches on like agent to agent communications or whatever and you might because like and it also gets on the idea of like if you had an old mainframe app that's been running for 20 years and you really don't want to replace it you could put an AI interface like this on top of it. As long as you have like 3270 terminal emulation on the server where you could actually like standard in, standard out type talk to the mainframe and control the mainframe just like you can control a web page or anything else, you would be able to provide a conversational interface to a mainframe system without actually changing one line of code in the mainframe application. So, would you need the mainframe application to be visible to the user? Maybe not. And then um, would you, but you still need the app because ultimately that's what's really doing the work until you rebuild the whole app. Okay, and we have another question here. Yeah, so um, for me, because I'm not too big on the technical term, are you basically saying that this app can like walk between the walls of your other app? Like there's no need to link any code because it almost works as a secondary you. It's walking into it through the front door, not having to go. Anywhere. Right. Like if it's a web page, yeah. like I bring up a browser. I have a, I have a, uh, a Chrome plugin too. The Chrome plugin talks to the web code that you saw in the video, and it, it tells it to do things that JavaScript running in the Chrome plugin can do things that regular. I couldn't just. In my JavaScript in a normal web page, I can't just open up YouTube and start pressing buttons. There's security things that but would it, stop But it that. knows how to open the wall. Yeah. It's almost like a secondary. And page. if you think about an old Windows desktop app, you wrote it in VB6 in 1997. And, and it's still being used on Windows 10. Well, there's tools that can automate those apps too, like QA testing teams love to do the, I think it was called RoboTest or something like that, where you could like have it fill in fields and press buttons and read values. That's the same thing I would need to know how because to control the app. Because it's basically just still data. It was just data in another form. So as long as you have it, it can still go into it as well because it's just simply data, the same way data is today. Right, so if the user the can do it, okay. then the AI can do it, and you're building like those text prompts I was showing to explain to the AI what it can do. Like here, get user app state provides details about the current page or view in the current application the user is on and what and when they ask. Use this when you need to know details about the view for you to describe it and what the user can do. So we're on a page and the user says, hey, what can I do here? It would call this function, and then I would give it back this nice piece of text that would describe it. Yes? How often do you need to feed that context to the LLM? Is it kind of as needed? Yeah, as needed. I mean, what do you mean? Like, explain that question. So that example that you gave, right. you know, how do I do X, Y, Z, right? Um, <coughs> so does that retrieve this, um, I don't know, this YAML? Right. Or whatever. Yeah. And is that, do you feed it only then, or is it already preloaded with um, all these stuff? You know, um, when, that, when I type in something like, what can I do in this application, um, the, uh, before it goes to, like, say, OpenAI, it says, oh, I'm in the story writer view, um, and so I'm going to call this service that says, give me a list of the tools. So I have a service that the back end uses that says, here's the user, 
here's the um, that and what application they're in and um, what view they're in in that application and then I get back a list of tools that I give to OpenAI along with the whole conversation history the um, and everything else that you do when you send a prompt up to the OpenAI the tools that they can use are a part of that okay so you have one layer that kind of fetches the context um, using the LLM yeah, like you're in the UI and you started typing a question. The UI says, hey, uh, the, the user said, what can I do here? Mm -hmm. That's all it said from the UI. That's all it knows. The tools are all in the server. So the server says, oh, bef I'm about to go through this process. So I, there's all this stuff I need to do before I can send that to, to the LLM. There's a lot of, there's all these things that happen. And then one of those is what are the tools that are available for the user at this moment? Which is also based on your security privilege. Like you may not, have, if you don't have the ability to use certain tools that are available in the app, the AI shouldn't be offering it to you as something you can do even though you're not capable of doing it. Uh, so the AI doesn't have necessarily memory That's right, that's the fine tuning versus disembedding. Like in order for it to have all this memory, what you're referring to is I would assume fine tuning the model, that can take weeks. And I can just come in and tweak that text and have it work immediately um, you know, and test it. Like if I build a good enough system, maybe you're experimenting with the company's version of this. So you see the version you're editing, but everyone else sees the normal one. And then when you're ready, you say mine is the standard one now. And now everyone else would use what you're using. That's really clever. Thank you. Yeah. And to the uh, point with the agent, you said booking like travel, like just as a concept, an idea with the AI walking right. through the wall. Are you saying that in this sense, it would say, okay, I want a flight to Istanbul, and it just knows me, I want business class, unless it's 30% more than regular class, and it can't be a star alliance, and it can only be near, you know, like it'll know that, and say for the flight for you is X, because right. we already are built into who you are. you see here, it's popping up these browsers, and I can, um, it takes all this content, that's what this list is on the side, if I click on one of those, it's going to show me that content, it's been sent up to the AI, it's been stripped of all the HTML, turned into markdown I get a list of all the anchors and images and the content in there in a way that then lets the AI get an understanding of what this page is so what I'm trying to build with that is and so I'm, this is active development that I can build a task goal of I want you to pay my utility bill that's it Pay, th that's the description of it. Pay my utility bill. And now an instance of that is I use Cox for my internet access. So it should be able to pop open Cox, see that we're how to log in, notice that the login is already there from my security, the way the browser set up, just hit the login button, see that the utility bill is ready to be paid and that it's already hooked up to my personal account. It just has to hit the button, pay it now. Maybe there's that checkbox. Yeah, Yes, I, I read the agreement or whatever, then press the button. Yes, yeah, so I meant so it like walks between all the walls. Yeah, that's right. Because you're counting on the AI to do kind of like what a person does, which is read the web page. It knows it has a goal. I want to pay the utility bill. I'm going to look at the web page. It says, oh, I should probably have to log in first. So I'll try that. I mean, that's and the. Yeah, because it's right there with you. you. This isn't happening on my server where you gave me your Cox utility AP login and password. The browser window pops open right there and you see exactly what it's doing and you can stop it at any moment with that little yellow button on the top over there. So what if you know something so egregious to stop? Right, or yeah, maybe it's going to ask me, are you sure you want yeah, to do that? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So the question I have is, it sounds like you curate the web pages. Yeah. Okay, because like a couple examples that I've hear, heard is like, you want the uh, weather for Vegas. Right. Okay, great. It goes and gets just the generic weather, but I really want the National Weather Service because I'm going cannoneering and I really want that nuance on that. How does it know on that? Or as, as what we just heard over here, I want to go um, to Istanbul on business class, 
and maybe not all the air, uh, airlines are on there. There may be some private um, uh, sh uh, contracting um, th uh, flights that you can go on there. How does it? How does it know? Or how do I update it so that it knows kind of my behaviors or what I want to want to do? Part of that, um, my answer to that with this app, and again, we're, I just want to make it clear that we're deviating away from like app control per se, like and how f and how far the other app is able to use that by ex some of these things we're talking about. You're logged in, and it has awareness of your schedule and things about you. Like one of these tabs is a counselor page where it actually can do like counseling, human counseling with you, and all that knowledge builds up about you inside of the system and it's capable of using it like in the rag you know so when I ask it like if I were to ask it to write a story about my life because I've already told it so much about my life it would pound out and it has I mean like holy I did tell you about that stuff didn't I you know and it's like it because it's got all that stuff about my whole life like a bio an autobiography inside of it so if you um, part of it would be that I would ask it to I want to view the weather on this national page like I, instead of it just answering it through a tool I'd rather it pop the weather channel or whatever nationalweather.com or whatever in the browser and just navigate to the weather like the zip code that I would want it to go to so that's you t being more specific in what you want not just saying what's the weather in Vegas and because if I don't build a tool it's not going to answer that for me so I would have to build a tool that would maybe use a generic service like you said but that's different from saying show me the national weather page and with the Las Vegas weather report on it or something like that that would be me being more specific to drive it in there and then where I'm trying to build those task goals is once you set up those like once I say go to YouTube music and it knows I'm playing these types of songs I want to be able to just tell it play Dua Lipa and it's gonna play I, I don't have to tell it to go to YouTube and stuff because I've already done those things and it, the task has been set up a little bit more like at first it, I had to tell it do this and that and then it it got to know that over time you know so uh, there's a memory system that goes along with um, the app that you can how much you teach it about yourself or the in knowledge you want it to know I mean in other classes I've or other AI event uh, meetups I've done here I've talked about the memory system like being able to build this 3d memory model of all your data and that is a part of this overall system but that, that that's just like now I want to be able to control all that with a conversation because I lose people like if there's a lot of technical stuff in this app but it's really all about creating images stories and having conversations and it can publish out to a website so and control things through the web page you know but really you're creating content all the other tools are gathering data bringing getting it ready to answer those questions maybe the stories are a marketing report or maybe it's an ad that you want to put on Facebook or something like that maybe you want to, it's a post for for LinkedIn but it's still just a story right so Anyone else have any other questions? Or? Um, it's a fascinating, and when you, one thing I would say that is um, when you start having a conversation and you move around between like, um, what can I eat for lunch? What's my schedule? You're talking about your family. You're controlling the application. It's the closest thing to Jarvis, like out of Iron Man, that I've ever seen. But minus the arms and the spacesuit or whatever, um, the ability to just talk to an application and that it's taking action for you and that it knows you and that you can switch context from what am I going to eat for lunch to I want to write a new story to I want, you know, about a marketing report for something or uh, and other um, tasks as well, you know, then uh, it the games and whatnot are actually pretty powerful because you can create your own te text adventure game and where that thing is going um, you have a conversation and you turn that into a new game so if you wanted to build a game about being on a, a spaceship that's orbiting what do they call it, those um, 
space stations orbiting the planet and there's all these rooms you can go around and there's a goal to you have to turn on the oxygen support before the whole space station um, runs out of oxygen and then everyone dies you could just have a conversation about the game and it would build the game for you and then you could play it um, with images audio i cut off the images in the audio but normally if you've seen any of this before there's um, images that Malazel has a face, she has a voice too. You can hear her speak to you when you're, um, but I, I cut it off because um, sometimes it gets in the way of, of the topics at hand. Um, yeah, sure. I had a, uh, another question um, to your point with the Jarvis, with the uh, Iron Man was a great right. example that yeah. it's so in, intertwined with you. There's no need to even interact with the app interface. It'll just get you what the answer is. Are there any controls against negative influence? Like if it knows I only have 500 in my bank account and I say, hey, take me to the nearest sports book, will it know that this is inherently a horrendous decision being that I'm upside down on my mortgage because it knows that too? And yeah, I mean, me? it's not, yeah, it'll know whatever. I mean, it actually knows a lot about me. Um, sometimes I do worry about that too, but, um, you know. So it won't get in the way of inherently bad decision. It'll, it'll still continue to take you to the sports book and all that stuff. I, I just want to make sure I understand that question. You take you to the sports book? Oh, no, the example was bad behavior. Like, will it, will it display bad behavior? You said it's all the way. Uh, oh, no. Oh, so one of the things it does have in there is, um, shoot, the AI personalities have um, a content rating output. So you have the ability to go from, like, AI7, which is, like, five-year-olds, and the topics are going to be shaped into that. I mean, like, you can't leave that world. To... Uh, like PG-13, like AI-13, also mature audience. Mature audience is more about like, I can talk about surgeries. I'm willing to talk about drugs and other things like that. Um, but then there's an MA+, plus, which is adult content to a certain degree. It won't go, I mean, no LLM that I run will go too far down that road, but they can be trained to do that kind of stuff, yeah. Can I have a question? So does the app know to like dynamically switch between different applications to do a full process? So like for example, you mentioned the Facebook ad, like it could post it to Facebook and then if someone messages, it knows to respond and then it can even send an email, add it to your calendar, set up a time to meet with that person or do you have to like prompt each You would want you would need to process. set through that processes like that's what I was trying to get at with the task goal. Like if you had a task goal to go on to LinkedIn, check for posts, like certain posts that meet a certain quality, re even comment automatically to say five posts that you see on your wall, be people that are first level connections, maybe some second level connections, and um, look at profiles, like um, just let the AI click on your browser to go to other people's, like look at 50 or 100 different people people's uh, homepage. You would want to build that out as goals, but what you wouldn't be, in the old ways, I, I might be doing regular expression parsing to say, okay, I'm on this page, I'm going to pull this out, I see that field there, I click now type this value in that field, and if they change the page, then the app's got to be updated. Now you're relying on the AI to have a high level um, goal, pay my utility bill add a post to uh, this to LinkedIn, create a new post, and that it's going to read the content and use the navigation and other tools like a person would click things. So yes, you would still need to create this task goal to say, I want you to do this, and then I want you to do this, and then to do these things. Um, be, but you wouldn't have to like hand do all the tedious little things that you would normally do in the old days before the AI, because basically you're counting on the AI to make sense of what it sees on the page so that it can do the next steps for you. And that's the and same thing with awareness and control. Like if you built a, a tools for LinkedIn, it would, could be even more powerful. Like I could build tools that control LinkedIn to say, hey, I need to go to this person's profile. I need to go do these things, grab the profile and get it to me in the conversation in a way that is more direct and, and powerful. I, I could build those kind of things into it if I wanted to. So uh, like a, to me, like a, to, and the last thing I'll say is, is that imagine a government agency that has 30 years of applications, like 
two, three hundred applications. Like the Department of Transportation in most cities will have a couple hundred applications for managing all sorts of little things that they have to manage. And they'll be 30 years old from you know VB6 to .NET and all these other things because they don't want to ever rewrite an application. They just want to build new ones. And so um, they maintain these old applications forever. And imagine that you could build a system like this on top of that without rewriting everything. Like in just a couple of months, you could automate and now employees don't have to learn 200 different apps from VB6 style menus and all that to web interfaces. It could just be an AI conversation. Is the interface advanced enough that you could take the VB6 code, drop it in there and say, give this to me in Java or whatever? Nah, I mean, um, the tool, that, that, that's a, that's a it can do those little things where the developer driving every little aspect of it. Like, I'm pretty impressed with the amount of, I, I use AI code quite a bit, actually. But I have to have the architecture already in place. I already have to say, this is exactly how I want to build. I don't just say, here's this app, we'll build a word processor and expect it, no. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah. I'm not technical at all here, but I have, some, have a question. I don't know if it's really relevant either, but um, if I have a legal document, I scan it, and then if I want to extract certain information, create a report, um, is that something can be done easily, or is like, is there, are there tools that we can do that? Yeah, I mean, that's what the main application, part of it is like, um, I can go into a company and go onto their Confluence. Like, let's say all your legal documents were stores 10,000 of them in Confluence. I can just go in there and suck all those up into the RAG system and then run them through these series of prompts that create semantic knowledge out of it, like a semantic network. Like, who are all the people? What are their roles? What are all the clients? What were the legal cases and things? Where you can see a graph of that and then you can build all sorts of stories, like reports and other things from that. Like, give me a story or a report of all the engineering teams that have been in this company for the last 10 years or ever mentioned in Confluence, who's worked on them, and when was the last time they had any effort done on them. And then you get all that out of Confluence. Thank you. And uh, we got about seven minutes left. Um, and uh, I don't think I... I think we went through most of these um, points already. Go ahead. Uh, do you have any um, sort of plans to QA test some of these actions um, just for consistency? Yeah, um, the, the, the way I usually work is more of like deploy and test in production and do that behind an A-B test. So like take the example of I have a tool and it's working fine, but this guy behind you is working on the next version of it. He'll do that right in production, but his version is only going to be visible to him and anyone else in the A bucket of like an optimizely A-B test. And I control that only engineers in the company are in the A bucket. And then we test it or QA it through the production environment. And then when we feel like it's ready for regular people to use, that version becomes the version everyone else use. Like we can either change the bucketing, like keep the optimizely test up, or pu push up another code base that just says it's always on and doesn't use the optimizely test anymore. Yeah, but uh, how would you um, like compare, uh, you know, these actions? Wouldn't you rather just run like ten thousand of a certain action and get real data on your loss? It's hard to, um, you know, like if you're talking about like unit tests and integration testing, it's hard for me to know exactly what's going to come out of the LLM. So it's almost like yeah, that's the point. Is is how would you get consistency among actions? You don't, and I almost want it to not be consistent because if it was bank accounts, and I'm if I don't transfer the exact amount of money that I said I wanted to be transferred, and I didn't build some kind of like, are you sure you want to transfer the five thousand or whatever? And I just did it. Then that would be something I might be careful about how this drives it. Like, does it just happen or does it confirm with the user that I really want to be able to do it? Um, but yeah, 
I like the variability it's, because when you're working with a person, like maybe they didn't get a good night's sleep and they're gonna act a little bit differently today than they did yesterday. And I like the variability as long as it consistently does what I wanted to do, even if it is a little different, or maybe I had to ask again, like, so I had to tell it, try again. Like sometimes you have to try again. And that's just the downside. Like if certain industries, it's just not gonna be a good. Is, is there any like effort put in place to like quantize some of these actions into a model rather than run a fellow on every time? Yeah, I mean, there are other ways to do this approach where you're not using an LLM for that interaction. They're machine learning systems that were probably gonna be more, much more consistent once you went through that training effort. But the conversational aspect of it is an important part of what's going on. Like, like um, for me, like the story writing, I can say, first have this conversation about, man, um, I, was, I spent the summer with my so older son. He came over for college and this and that happened. And it's, we start, next thing you know, it's like an hour of talking about this time this summer with my son. I say, you know what, let's turn that into a story. And it takes all that content from this conversation and just creates that story from it and then I can refine that from there. It took the conversation, it's, um, and so there, it, there's nothing I'm aware of right now that's going to allow me to like know I'm gonna get the exact same response. Now, I have seen some of these models allow you to control the seed. And the seed is a number that like is part of the randomly a generated value normally that guides the making it so where each time you ask the same question you get a slightly different response by letting you control the seed which I think they just now let you do in chat TPT API I think that their preview API has a seed or maybe it's the even the 4.0 has a seed property now and that gets you much more consistency so if you need it to be really consistent about those tools, um, you might even go with a fine tuning. And that is one of the things I kind of mentioned in here. Uh, fine tuning versus embedding. Um, the fine tuning, it gives you less instantaneous different, you know, like go edit the prompts and you're ready to go. But you can get more consistent and output. Um, and use different types of models besides um, transformer models. You know, that's what we're really using here. Transformer models are the typical LLM. Go ahead, would you get a few more here? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, so with regards to the storytelling, yeah, you're right, you, you, you want to like have it as creative as possible, but can't you restrict, you know, um, the AI, uh, whether it's in an agent or an assistant or whatever, by one on the LLM level by limiting the temperature so that you get more consistent thing and then after that like okay and then the access to the tools that they're allowed to use and then even with the access to the tools on the actions on what what they can use like isn't that a way to like kind of limit what uh, the AI, AI can do? Yeah yeah for sure the tools and what um, is exposed based on the user the view and everything only exposing the ones that they can actually use that helps you to make sure it doesn't do something stupid but it, it can do things you know wrong I mean that, that there's no way around that yeah anyone else have other questions? No. Oh. Well, it's right on the button noon, too, so Everybody, I appreciate uh, your time. Matthew, thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. That was great. I have a quick question. Um, for the next AI meetup, um, I'm thinking about doing a presentation on chain of thought. Is anybody here familiar with chain of thought is? Oh, good, good. This is basically LLMs developing the ability to plan out a series of steps to solve problems. And you might have heard that Strawberry from, um, you know, ChatGPT is out, OpenAI, and they use Chain of Thought. There's a couple of other uh, products that do this, and it's revolutionizing everything. We are literally seeing LLMs now able to do like in the 97th percentile uh, of physics and science problems and math problems. This is pretty cool stuff. The other thing I was interested in is, are, are folks familiar with reinforcement learning? Okay, that's a big deal to make that happen. 
These are not necessarily deep technical subjects. They can be, but we don't need to go there. But I would want everybody uh, potentially have an understanding of how it's going to take us forward. So is chain of thought something every, everybody would be interested in, yeah? yeah? Okay, excellent. We'll do that for the next one. Um, and the other thing, I always put this out. If anybody is working in this area, either as a business person facing challenges and using uh, AI prompt engineering in their business and that sort of thing, and they've had some luck, some traction, making it work, I would love to see you present, okay? Come tell people about what you've done. If you're a practitioner and you're actually doing prompt engineering and you have some more stories to tell, I'd love for you to come and talk about those because I like to get the practical aspect in. Yes.